<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Monster Chiller Thriller Wine 14. I'm your ghoulish host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're killing that like button and subscribing to the channel. If you don't, then I'll come find you. <laughs> Oh, all right. Welcome back to my favorite episode to do each year. This year, I'm kind of going old school, mostly inexpensive wines. I don't expect uh, any of these to be really life-changing wines, but there may be a gem or two in this group. There, These are wines that I could totally see at an any ordinary Halloween-themed party. I also brought a small section of candies, you can't really see, to pair with them. I'll admit I already broke into the stash of these a few days ago, so I don't really have much less left over, but they sure were tasty. As a matter of fact, I ran out of a couple of them, but I have four different candies here. That's plenty. Um, I also have four different wines. So let's just get into whatever background info I can muster for them. All right, first up is the Sangre de Toro 2019. This is part of the Miguel Torres family of wines. Now, you'd never know that from the familiar Torres website, but the back label of this wine says it all. Plus, I will, well, I was able to confirm that elsewhere. Links for that are below in the description. I have an episode about one of their Chilean wines that, well, very briefly goes into their history, but I'll concentrate on this brand. Uh, the original winery was founded in 1870 by Jaime Torres. In the 1950s, Miguel Torres Carbo, uh, who was the third generation to run the company, was exploring the Catalonia area of Spain. This is in the northeast part of the country bordering France. Some of the DOs, or... Uh, Appellations include Penedes, uh, Terra Alta, Prerat, Monsant, and uh, Costeros del Segre, among others. He was looking for vineyards growing Garnacha, also known as Grenache, and Car Carienia, also known as Carignan. The first wine was made uh, in 1954. Over the years, they expanded and became more of a global brand. They are distributed uh, in over two, I'm sorry, 100 countries. We don't have 200 countries in this world. Uh, <laughs> distributed in over 100 countries. So it's not a small production wine. In 2018, they became certified vegan. In 2021, they became, uh, the brand became the official partner of the Spanish football team. Hence, I think this is why the label is red, from what I can tell. Uh, it used to be a white label, but they mentioned something about red on the website uh, in conjunction with the, with the team. Now, I had originally wanted to get some Hungarian bull's blood wines and continue the theme with these guys. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any of the Hungarian versions available, at least not in the usual places I look for it. Um, I do like the little bull charm on the side, though. That's kind of cool. All right, so let's get the stats for this wine. 2019 Sangre de Toro Original. It's a $14.99 normal retail price. Uh, it's the Dio Catalunya. It's made from Garnacha, Carienia. We don't know the percentages of those. It's aged six months in American and French oak. Pro maybe maybe barrels, probably used barrels. We didn't, they didn't specify. It's certified vegan. Uh, the ABV is 13.5%. The only one I have the rest of the info for, because I found a, a text sheet, um, the TA or total acidity is 5.1 grams per liter. The pH is 3.59. And the residual sugar, the RS, is 0 0.6 grams per liter. So this is technically a really dry wine. Matter of fact, if you were if you were trying to uh, market this, it, it, the FDA would almost, almost allow you to market this as a zero sugar wine because you have to have no more than 0 0.5 grams per liter uh, five grams per serving of RS. This is at the top end of what's allowed in Europe of having no more than four grams per liter. I'm sorry, no, this is, sorry. Actually, this it, this could be, I'm sorry, this could be considered a, a no sugar wine because it's 0 0.6 grams per liter. That's like less than a 10th of a gram per serving. So this would be considered a zero sugar wine, but they don't market it that way. Anyway, next we have the 2019 Apothic Inferno. I did a white wine from them a couple years ago. Today we're gonna to do red. Now all the wines tonight are actually red. There isn't too much to say about this winery. They say the name was inspired by the Apotheca, which was a quote, mysterious place where wine was blended and stored in 13th century Europe. Okay, yeah, when I looked it up last time, Apothic is, means warehouse. 
All right, anyway, the brand definitely embraces a Halloween vibe without being a Halloween brand. It's got a bit of that gothic style to it. People definitely drink the brand year round. So unlike some other wines, it's not just for this one time, not just one, it's not just one for this time of year. This wine's shtick is the aging in whiskey barrel for 60 days. We don't have a listing of grapes to use, but if I had to guess before I tasted it, it's probably some combination of Petite Syrah, Petite Verdot, Zinfandel, Alicante, Boucher, maybe some Syrah, and who knows what else. Uh, they also say it's oak aged for two to four months. No mention of the kind of oak or if it's new or used, but considering the price point, I highly doubt we're talking barrels. Probably staves are more likely chips. This is possibly true for the Sangre de Toro, but since it's really inexpensive to make wine in Spain, they're probably using old, like uh, used barrels. Um, anyway, nothing wrong with that as far as the chips or the staves. A wine like this is looking for the flavor, is not looking for the flavors of oak barrels. Um, Sorry, a wine like this is looking for the flavors of oak barrels, not the oxygenation of oak barrels. So with, with chips and, and staves, you're not getting the, you're not getting the, the wines are becoming smoother and rounder from oxygen slowly getting into the wine. You're just getting those flavors that oak will bring to it, like vanilla and clove and cinnamon and all that kind of stuff. All right, so let's get the stats for the Apothic. So it's a 2019 Apothic Inferno. Uh, it's... I paid $11.55 for it. It's California. It's a red blend. Again, we don't know what the grapes. It's oak aged two to four months. So remember, we don't know if it's a barrel, what kind of size, or, or, the, or how, old it, how old it is, what kind. Uh, aged 60 days in whiskey barrels. This will be barrels. Um, the ABV is 15.9%. Now this is not from the whiskey barrels. This is all about super ripe fruit. We'll see how sweet it tastes too. All right, moving on to the third wine, the 2020 Charles & Charles Bolt Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, this is a legit collaboration between two well-known winemakers, Charles Beeler and Charles Smith, who's a well-known winemaker in Washington State. Beeler runs the Père Fils Winery in Provence, France. His father, Philippe, the Père of Père Fils, that means father and son, by the way, founded Chateau Rutas in the Coteau Varois region of Provence. Charles joined him eventually selling their wines. They sold the winery in 2005 to found the Beeler Parrot Fils. Since, not Parrot, Per et Fils, all right? Since then, Charles has collaborated with not just Charles Smith, but also Joel Gott, uh, Roger Scomania, I think it's Scomania or, so, or Scomegna, but it's probably Scomania, and uh, Bruce Schneider to create wines from all over the world. The focus is on French and Washington State though but they do have wines from elsewhere. Charles Smith grew up near Napa Valley. However, his wine journey wasn't from where he was from, but from managing rock bands in Europe. How cool is that? And living the wine life that way. In 1999, he visited Walla Walla, Washington and got inspired to make wine there. His first release was in 2001 and he never looked back. Numerous acc accolades followed. For their Charles and Charles project, they make three different wines, Double Trouble, a Rosé, and this one, Bolt. The fruit from this wine comes from Goose Ridge Vineyards. They are located next to the Red Mountain AVA, uh, and they're actually in the Yakima Valley AVA, but the wine is labeled Columbia Valley AVA, most likely because there's maybe much better name recognition for Columbia Valley with the general public than Yakima Valley. Uh, it also might help keep the costs down in, in the sense of you're not getting more specific AVAs. So when you get more specific, you tend to charge more for the wine because, well, you're getting it all from, a, getting all the grapes from a specific area and that can imply higher cost and quality. With that said, there's some legit winemaking going on here. Uh, they have a long maceration, about 35 days, of which half of that is using native yeast fermentation. Besides the Cabernet Sauvignon, they blended in some Syrah. It also, that also went through a native fermentation and they used whole cluster fermentation for the Syrah. The wine is then aged in used barrels this is to soften and concentrate the wine rather than lather it in toasty vanilla, among other flavors. The story about the label is they were proud of making a low intervention wine with a high integrity approach. Those are their words. They wanted the label to quote, reflect the pure, raw, natural power of the process and resulting wine. We feel that the lightning bolt perfectly captures the essence of the naturally made pure and bold red wine. 
All right, guys, no pressure here, but you're kind of making it sound like this is going to be the star of the show. It probably will be. Anyway, let's get the stats for this wine. So it's the 2020 Charles & Charles Bolt Cabernet Sauvignon. I paid $12.27. Uh, it's from Columbia Valley. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Syrah, again, we don't know the percentages of them. 35 days maceration for the cab. Again, no time given for the Syrah as far as maceration. The whole cluster fermentation, though, for the Syrah. It's aged in used barrels. No mention of the how long the type or how old of the barrels are. And its ABV is 13.8%. All right, the last wine. This was a last minute edition, though I'll say that I was originally looking for it when I found out about it. Either I missed it when I bought the other wines or it wasn't available that day. It's the 19 Crimes Dracula Red Blend. They make a Frankenstein cab too. Okay, this is totally for the label. And uh, my notes says turn off the lights, but in doing the bottle shot, you're really not gonna see much. So uh, maybe I threw up a, a picture of what it's supposed to look like with the lights off. The, the label glows in the dark, all right? And by the way, uh, Dracula has a message for you. Oh, what a long day. The night is upon us, and Halloween is right around the corner. Speaking of which, dinner's here. Oh, not like that. I mean our dinner order has arrived. This very old vine will pair beautifully with those lamb chops you ordered. I hope you like it. Cheers. Let's eat. I have 500 years worth of stories to tell. Let me know if I told you this one. As far as the brand, it's 19 Crimes. They entered the market a while ago, highlighting Australia's history of being a penal colony for England and the 19 crimes that could get you in prison. As far as this wine, well, this is all I got. Non-vintage 19 Crimes Dracula Red Blend. I paid $9.99. It's from Southeastern Australia. It's a red blend, grapes are unknown, and the ABV is 13.5%. Yeah, it's all I got. <laughs> I'm going to guess the grapes will mostly be Shiraz or Syrah and Cab, since that's some of the most planted red grapes in Australia. Most likely it's like some bulk juice they decided to have some fun with. All right, let's try the wines. All right, so normally I um, don't Corvin this stuff, but um, as I said, these are, one, there's four of these wines here and I have no idea how fast I'm gonna drink them. Um, and I am going to a party later this week, uh, as far as the week that I'm recording this. And I might, depending on the wines, I might like bring one or two of these bottles. So keeping them nice and sealed is ideal. Though I will probably give myself a little bit healthier pour than normal. All right, this is, this is actually the first episode that I'm doing since uh, well, I record a crap ton of videos earlier this year and since I took the advanced exam. There might be an update type video coming out at some point in a couple weeks. Um, there's some things that I might be doing or I'm trying to finish up that I'd like to kind of announce, so to speak. Um, but the bottom line is uh, I didn't pass the advanced exam. And um, when I went to Phoenix in July, I didn't, I didn't pass the deductive tasting portion. I did pass the service practical or the you know, mock service. Um, and uh, I plan on taking the exam next year. Matter of fact, uh, today, the day I, I, I'm recording this, I officially signed up to take the theory exam. So I paid my $100 um, to do that. And the way things are now, uh, as long as you meet the criteria to take the exam, in other words, you've, you've uh, taken the uh, course, the advanced uh, exam course, you just sign up for it. It used to be you had to qualify by being in a, uh, by uh, taking some type of, you know, knowledge assessment and they, they kind of got rid of all that. I'm glad they did. Anyway, see what else to talk about while I'm pouring some wines. That's really it. Uh, I also today on the social said, don't expect me to be hanging out on social media very often because 
you know, it's time to start studying for real. The theory exam is Thursday. It's not Thursday. Well, it is a Thursday. Um, is Friday, not Thursday, Thursday, February 22nd. I don't know why I had a hard time figuring that out. So I have just slightly less than four months to be ready, which I will be because it's really just review time. Okay. Got her issue over here as usual. And like I say every year, yes, I know the skull in Macbeth, whatever the fucking play is, uh, the skull is not Horatio. Horatio is one of the characters. But the very first Halloween episode I did, I said it was Horatio. And then I realized my error after I said it, that it wasn't Horatio. All right. So um, we're just going to go right into right into the wine. So the first one is the Sangre de Toro. So on the nose, got some red fruit, kind of cherry, strawberry, cranberry. They're drier in nature. Get a little earthiness too out of this. A little dirt. I feel like you get a little bit of tar in it. Ooh, I just got a whiff of mushroom. Some greenness to it. Not like bell pepper or anything like that, but like a some type of just moss, I guess you want to call it that. Let's just taste it. That's tasty wine. So my feeling is wines one and three are going to be the wines that are probably going to be actually really good. Um for the price point that they are. Um, and this one, I mean, it's just like a legitimately good red blend from Spain. It's not sweet at all. Um, the fruit actually kind of, the fruit kind of finishes off a little tart. Like if I was pairing it with, I wouldn't, this is not a wine I would probably pair with, with any of these. You stay right there, buddy. Um, with any of these candies, expecting it to really like enhance the candies. The candy will probably come across as bitter if I do that. Um, but if you're having a party, like a Halloween party, it's not just about candy. You might have like the party I'm going to, they'll have like legit food. They'll have, they usually do like barbecue stuff. This would be great with barbecue, burgers, pizzas. So if you had like finger food type stuff, you know, um, like pizza rolls or, or any type of meat type of thing, or like, you know, cheese, meats and cheeses, you know, charcuterie stuff, right? This would be a perfect wine for that. Yeah. So. It's, it's, it's fairly light on the, on the palate. Um, it's somewhat Pinot Noir-like as far as body. Garnache, uh, Garnacha and Carignan, uh, they can act like that. They're, they can be lighter bodied wines. Um, it's not super high in alcohol, but I, I do feel the alcohol a little bit. Granted, it's been a little while since I had anything to eat. I mean, I'm recording this at almost one o'clock in the morning and I had dinner at like 6.30? 6, 6.30, so, you know, it's a good six hours since I've really had anything to eat, uh, but I do feel it, but it's not over the top, you know, it's in that 13 some odd percent range, um, what was it, 13.5, 13.8, 13.5, so, I mean, it's right there, uh, it's in balance, um, you got, you got the cranberry, strawberry, raspberry, uh, they're drier in nature, uh, I got a little bit of blackberry in there too, um, and there is this, um, woodsy, uh, foresty type of thing. I don't really get the mushroom on the palate like I did on the, on the nose for the, that brief second. Um, a little bit of moss, that type of stuff. There's a, yeah, it's kind of woodsy. Uh, it's just no other really way for me to put it. It tastes really good. All right, moving on. All right, the Apothic Inferno. So, man, I really wish I could do the Disco Inferno song. Uh, without getting a copyright strike, but there you go. I put it in your head. Burn, baby, burn, Disco Inferno. If you don't know the song, look it up. All right, right off the bat, I mean, it, it hits you in the face with oakiness. And this has got to be, it's got to be from like oak chips uh, or maybe oak staves in, in, the, in the stainless steel uh, fermentation tanks. But yeah, I mean, it smells good. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. On the nose, it smells like a high quality wine. It's got that vanilla, that clove, that um, uh, cinnamon. It's got that creaminess, that that kind of uh, whipped cream uh, type of thing uh, going on. Like like you're smelling like this raspberry, blackberry pie. Yeah, um, absolutely. A little bit of, uh, of uh, um, incense. So you get like that frankincense and myrrh, the Christmas spices going on. It smells good. It smells like you walked into a barrel room. 
and it smells rich. It smells dense. It smells it smells sweet. It smells ripe. The fruit is very ripe in nature. Um, there is a bit of a burn to it, and, and you do get you do get the whiskey like it's bourbon. More of a bourbon thing. Now you can get you can get these whiskey lactones from American oak. Um, we call it whiskey lactones because American whiskey, American bourbon, is aged in American oak, um, and a lot of it is like brand new American oak as far as the whiskey is concerned for part of the, as far as the regulations. So once those barrels are used, they they got to do something with them. So there's been kind of this trend for I don't know five, six, seven years where wineries are using these old, these used, even if they've only been used once, uh, whiskey barrels and using the aged wine to really enhance the whiskey lactone thing without buying a brand new barrel. So yeah, I mean, I literally think, I would literally think that I'm, I've got like a, an old fashioned in, in, my, in my glass here instead of a wine, almost. All right, old fashioned absolutely describes what this wine tastes like, except it's like a raspberry, cherry well, like a raspberry blackberry were added into into it not just whew, not just the um that's just the orange peel that you put with it with an old-fashioned um i mean there's a market for this absolutely there's a market for this like people who like whiskey and like bourbon and like old fashions and um uh manhattans you know, with you get you get the you get the maraschino the maraschino with maraschino cherry in there, like like the like the the old like legit um, Luxardo cherry in there. You get that, and almost like there's like syrupy. People who love that stuff will like this wine, and it's not expensive. It's not my style, however, I can see like guilty pleasure enjoying it. Now, how sweet is it? I mean, it's definitely sweeter than this wine, than, than this one here. But is this, are we talking like, are we talking like apothic red? That's like 15 grams per liter of sugar. Um, at least the last time I looked it up. Oh, it was, I think it's like closer to 11, 11 or 12. Is it like that level or like Naomi, which is now like 20 something grams per liter? No, I don't think it's, it could be 11. It could be. It could be somewhere between that 7 and 11. I looked up some of the other Apothic wines on LCBO, which is the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, because they list every RS for every wine they sell. They don't sell this wine, but they sell the Apothic Red, a Merlot, and a Cab, and something else. Um, and the ranges were around 7, which, not bad, actually, to like 11 or 12 or whatever. Um, this is probably in that range, and that's probably from back sweetening. Um, so they probably did that. But I mean, does it taste good? Yeah, for a lot of people it tastes good. Is it my style of wine? No. But I mean, like if I, if I was just gonna not bring, I'm probably gonna bring this to the party. I think they'll love it at the party. If I didn't bring it to the party, would I drink it? Yeah, I'd drink it. Like I would drink it like almost as a dessert wine, okay? Because it tastes sweet. Not that it is sweet, but it'll probably go really great with the candy. So let's move on to uh, the Charles and Charles. I'm excited to do this one. Because I'll be honest, I knew there was a I knew there was two people named Charles and Charles. I knew one of them was Charles Smith. I thought the other Charles was another Washington winemaker until I actually researched this. The Beeler wines I've had, especially they're, they're known for the rosés. They make fantastic rosés. Um, I have, and I they also make uh, the partner one of the partnerships he has is the Shatter, which is another French Grenache, which I've had that and that's fantastic. Uh, some of the other wines I'll probably throw up the the labels there. Um, I've heard some of some of them and some of the other ones I haven't. Uh, they make like a box wine called Bandit. It was a Pinot Grigio. I haven't had it. I've seen it out, out in the market. I think it does well, um, but I haven't tried it myself. Not that I can remember. I know I did a Pinot Grigio a long, long, long time ago when I went to the coast, but I don't think it was Bandit. It might have been something else. I'll look it up. All right, so this wine. <clears throat> so you really get a purity of fruit. Um, you get raspberry and blackberry on this. More black fruit than red fruit, but there's there's a good balance between the two. Um, it smells right. I get a touch of bramble to it, a, a little touch of non-fruit characteristics, like earthiness a little bit. Um, I do get some type of kind of spices, but that's probably not coming from the oak. It's probably coming more from the Syrah, 
The touch of Syrah that's in there. <clears throat> yeah. Let's taste it. So, I mean, it tastes like a cab Syrah blend. More like a cab, but because I know there's Syrah in there, Syrah sometimes gives me this kind of unusual flavor. It's not quite to that flavor I, I can get from Syrah and also Pinot and almost only from California fruit, but it can happen from fruit from other parts of the world. But I do get a little bit of that and I, I, I don't like I don't like calling out this this flavor because it makes it sound bad. But in some ways I do get a roasted coffee thing. But there's no we're using used barrels here. It doesn't mean these barrels don't have any toast levels. They can and that's where you can get some roasted coffee flavor. But um, it is a smooth wine. Like the tannin Considering it's at least 75% cab, and it's probably closer to 85% cab, um, the tannin is there, but the oak is not. In, is the oak's not adding to the tannin? The oak allowed there to be some oxygenation to it, so it allowed it to kind of soften a little bit. Um, it tastes good. This tastes. It tastes like a better wine than the price. Not dramatically better. I'm not saying this tastes like a $50 bottle of wine. But for $13, it kind of tastes closer to like a $15 to $20 bottle of wine. Um, and just, you know, the fact that there's native fermentation going on here, there's stem inclusion is probably where I'm getting that, um, that kind of earthiness. There's a little bit of bitterness to it. And I bet you that's where I'm getting. I bet you, you know what? I bet you it's the stem inclusion as to why I taste that one flavor. Because Syrah and Pinot Noir are known for stem inclusion. But it's weird that it's always California, or mostly California. But this is a wine I'll probably keep. I won't probably bring to the party. It's a dry wine. It is a dry wine. Uh, it's definitely as dry as the Sangre de Toro. It's probably not going to pair well with the, with, the, with the candies at all. All right. The last one, 19 Crimes. Now, back in my day when I worked at, at Morton's, Somebody wanted a sweet red. I would give them the 19 Crimes, whatever. I, I don't know what it was. Red blend. I don't know what it was. And they always say, oh, yeah, that's good. Um, I probably had it once or twice back then, but I don't remember it. So let's try it. Also, remember, this is a non-vintage wine. Again, so they probably just, they probably had some just juice. And were like, let's make Halloween wine. No problem with that because you're, you're there to make money, right? And there's a lot of bulk juice in Australia, especially southeastern Australia. So on the nose, how much? I mean, red fruit, black fruit. That's it. Kind of ripe tasting or smelling. A little vanilla-ish going on there, but not much else. Definitely not as aromatic as the other three wines. Let's just taste it. Okay, that little nod the head wasn't like, oh, this is a good wine. It was like, okay, it's all there on the palate. I also get that little bit of unusual flavor, but I highly doubt they have stem inclusion on this. They could. Um, so there's probably some Syrah. My, my, like I said, my guess is this Shiraz or Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon. <clears throat> they're the two most planted red grapes in Australia. Off the top of my head, I know Shiraz is. Uh, Cabernet Sauvignon should be like number two. After that, I don't remember. Probably Merlot and maybe some other grapes. But, um, you know, I don't know how much Alicante Boucher or Petite Syrah or Petite Merlot. These are other grapes that can give you like dark color and are easy to grow and usually inexpensive and you can do high yields with it. So you can make a lot of wine from them. Um, and not that, I, not that I'm looking at color necessarily, but it's not like a deep, deep, dark red color. Um, like it's, there is a bit of translucency to it. I mean, it's all in the palette. It's red and black fruit. It's like, it's like the Apothic Inferno turned down a little bit. Now, on the back label, they do say, and it is kind of light, they do say it's, um, I would say, a medium minus on the body. So, I don't know if you can see, I don't know if I'm, I'll try to zoom in on that. So, it goes from light to the top to bold in the bottom. And it's kind of in between mid, the midpoint and the top. So, it's like medium minus on, on the lightness. So, this could be a Grenache based wine too because they grow a lot of Grenache in Australia so 
this could be a Grenache Syrah blend, maybe with a little Viognier throw in there for some color stability rather than Cabernet Sauvignon. Because in some ways it comes across like the Sangre de Toro, right? But it's a sweeter wine, but it doesn't come across as sweet. It's a 13.5 alcohol also wine, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 13.5 alcohol. So it's actually good alcohol. It's, 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 it's not that bad. It's again, not my style, but if this was like someone's, if this was like some restaurants by the glass red blend from Australia, I wouldn't fault them for it. It's because, well, it's a, it's a $10 bottle of wine retail. So it's probably, I don't know, seven-ish dollars wholesale, maybe $6 wholesale, somewhere between six and seven dollars wholesale. And, you know, the restaurant probably could sell this for like seven bucks a glass or even six dollars a glass, but seven dollars a glass. You want some, you know, basic red blend. Yeah, it would work. It's it. I was expecting like really bad. Yeah. I mean, it's got the whiskey thing. It's got the oak thing. Um, there is a, a fakeness to it. Um, it's not my style. Anyway, let's let's hit uh, let's hit some let's hit some uh, candies real quick. So I got the Ghirardelli uh, dark chocolate raspberry square. Now the raspberry is like liquid. It's like you know liquid inside. It is so good. All right, I'm not gonna use wines one and three. I bet it's gonna go great with this. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's. It makes the wine better. All right, anyway, <laughs> let's do this again with the uh, Dracula wine. It works. It definitely works with that. Just for shits and giggles. It's my Halloween episode. I'm allowed to curse. Do what I want. It's my channel. We'll do the other two wines. I mean, the dark chocolate bitterness with the raspberry kind of works with that, but it is a little bitter. It's probably gonna be super bitter with this wine. That was a weird sound, wasn't it? Oh, you probably didn't hear it. Was I usually, well, I'm not afraid it. It's actually not that bad with this. I mean, yeah, wines one and three are definitely not good wine pairing wines. All right, so I got this Lindor milk chocolate caramel thing. Close the caramels inside. I was a fiend on these, on these, man. Yeah. Oh God, yeah. This is this is a candy wine. Also, I didn't mention it, <clears throat> but the high alcohol will automatically make it taste sweet. So that's why it may not be like 11, 12, 13, whatever, you know, grams per liter residual sugar because they don't need to back sweeten it that much. It is a high alcohol wine. It is a high you know, high octane wine, as I like to call them. And they're already going to taste sweet. And they got that alcohol from, well, they should have gotten it from just the, just, just the sugar in the grapes. So these things were probably at a high bricks level. I, I, I won't guess necessarily, but uh, 28 to 30 bricks, that's really high. For, for for wine, for grapes, but you can get to that bricks level. Um, so they probably got that high, but high alcohol is going to make things taste sweet and it could be technically a bone dry. Like I had, I had the, the Molly Duker uh, Boxer is 16%. They say it's actually higher than that. Um, and it's 0 0.6 grams per liter, like this one. It's a bone dry wine, but it tastes sweet. It's very fruit forward and very ripe tasting and it tastes sweet, but it's a bone dry wine. I waited too long. I don't know, the, yeah, that works. The other candies, the Crunch and the Kit Kat, they're probably gonna go fine with these wines. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. All right, so bottom line, you want wines for your party, that you're gonna have a lot of candy. You want crab pleasing wines, wines that People are just gonna be like, oh, it's so good. The Apothic Inferno and the Dracula. Especially if you can like show off the, the, the fact that the 
the label glows in the dark. It doesn't glow that brightly because, like I said, the camera, granted, I know I'm using an iPhone and it doesn't have the best sensor on it. But even just to my eye, and I had this thing under light for like, I don't know, 15 hours today. And when I turned off the lights, it was like, what? I can barely see it. So it's 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 kind of gimmicky but and the, the little um um uh, augmented reality thing that was kind of cute that was cool i'll admit that but um those two are definitely wines you would bring to a halloween party the other two wines these are wines i would keep for myself that i would just like i would have with meal with food um not candy and i do that all right so episode's gone long long enough I'm going to finish all four of these wines while I clean up and uh, look for some cool shit coming. Uh, I got all kinds of cool wines coming from all over the world. Um, yes, just from all over the world. Um, all kinds of different stuff. I even have more wines that might be coming. I, I haven't said yes yet. Uh, there's going to be some just all kinds of stuff. I probably will have to do two episodes a week for a while because I'm going to have so much wine. Um, if I don't, <laughs> these 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 wines won't get released. The reviews won't get released until like next summer. So I'll probably have to do some two weeks. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, it's my favorite show to do. Horatio, hey man, try some wine. Oh, you can't. Anyway. And uh, yeah, that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, I know this is always a long episode, but make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and to tell your friends. And we'll see you next time. I promise. Some of the following shows won't be as long. Some of them will, though. Later.